Thank you, and uh, good evening to you all. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to welcome you this evening to uh, the first in our uh, series of uh, public lectures uh, and talks that we're hosting throughout uh, this term here at Sheffield Hallam. Uh, tonight's talk is very much uh, going to be hopefully interesting as all. Uh, I'm not wearing a white suit with Honda written on the side of it, side of it deliberately having just seen that earlier video, but uh, Professor Adrian Hopgood uh, joined Sheffield Hallam just last year uh, as our new Pro Vice-Chancellor for the Sheffield Business School. Uh, he joins us for having previously worked at De Montford University, Nottingham Trent University and the Open University. Uh, as well as being a senior and experienced academic teacher and researcher, uh, Adrian has significant industrial experience having worked uh, with Telstra Research Laboratories in Melbourne, Australia, and also with System Designers PLC, which now became uh, part of Hewlett Packard. Uh, Professor Hopgood has published over 100 papers and supervised 15 PhDs uh, to completion uh, over his academic uh, working life. Uh, his textbook, Intelligent Systems for Engineers and Scientists, is ranked is one of the best sellers in its field, and the third edition has recently been published. And I think this uh, indicates uh, the popularity and the growing interest uh, in artificial intelligence. <coughs> He's a visiting professor at De Montford University and the Open University. He's a fellow of the British Computer Society, a chartered engineer, and a panelist for the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, the EPSRC. He holds a doctorate from the University of Oxford and a bachelor's degree from the University of Bristol. His lecture this evening is entitled Artificial Intelligence for All. And with the growing interest in artificial intelligence, for example, di demonstrated by his surging book sales, uh, and the, the fact that we're seeing increasingly the kind of application of arti artificial intelligence in our, our daily lives, I think we're very lucky to uh, hear this evening from one of the foremost experts in the field and to learn much more about how it can affect us all. So please, uh, can you all give a warm welcome this evening to Professor Adrian Hopgood. Uh, thanks very much, Cliff, and thanks very much, everyone, and uh, uh, good evening. Um, this is what I'm going to cover today. Uh, it's conventional at these events to say a few words about my personal background, although uh, Cliff's partially done that for me. Um, but then the real thrust this evening will be, first of all, uh, an introduction to the basic techniques of artificial intelligence. I'll talk a little bit about my pet topic, which is hybrids. That's to say, bringing together different artificial intelligence techniques to work collaboratively. And I'll also put a strong emphasis on practical applications. Uh, which is really the reason behind the, uh, the title, Artificial Intelligence for All. It's meant to uh, emphasize that uh, this is not just something for, for the research laboratories, this is something that uh, can really benefit us all in, uh, in everyday life, in business, in society. And I will try to show some examples and demonstrations, and I uh, hope they work. Um, so in terms of my personal background and uh, my journey to Sheffield Hallam, um, as I say, Cliff's already covered some of this, but uh, as you can see, my background uh, was uh, very scientific in, uh, in physics and, uh, and material science. And it was after my PhD that I decided I wanted to broaden myself and do something a little different, uh, which is why my first career job was with uh, systems designers. And um, it was there that I more or less stumbled into artificial intelligence. It was never part of the grand plan, uh, but uh, Systems Designers was quite an advanced company, did quite a lot of consultancy work, and I had the opportunity to join their artificial intelligence group. Um, I was there for a couple of years, and then my, I think, really formative years as an academic were spent at the Open University, where I had a, a total of uh, about 13 years, uh, with a little break in between. Um, and that's where I really developed my, my, my interests uh, further and had various research projects and, and, and indeed fed some of this through into teaching. Uh, from 2001 onwards, I've been um, involved in university management and leadership roles, uh, but I kept my hand in through, through my PhD students. So quite a lot of what you'll see reflects the work of PhD students. And as Cliff mentioned, the, the textbook has been quite an important part of uh, my career, certainly my research career. Um, 
You see there's a slight change of title from the first edition to the second edition. Um, and this book uh, was the core text for an open university course that ran for, for 12 years. Uh, and it's a real thrill to me, really, that uh, that's over 10,000 students worldwide have been introduced to artificial intelligence through, through that course. So turning now to the, uh, the, the topic of the, uh, the talk itself, the um, starting point, of course, is what is artificial intelligence? And you will see some uh, highfalutin definitions in, in textbooks, uh, but here's my preferred definition, quite a simple definition, that says that uh, artificial intelligence is the science of mimicking human mental faculties uh, in a machine or a computer. Um, and this field of research um, has been going for over 60 years. Um, if, you, uh, if you take the start point as being uh, Alan Turing's uh, seminal paper in 1950, where he, uh, he posed uh, the question about whether machines can think uh, and <coughs> proposed a test to, uh, to ascertain whether a machine was thinking or not. Um, the Dartmouth Conference six years later was also a, a milestone because that was the first published use of the term artificial intelligence. It wasn't really a conference as we would normally think of it, it was actually a, a get-together of a handful of the leading lights in computer science, but nonetheless their, uh, their theme for that get-together was, uh, was artificial intelligence. Uh, 1956 was also uh, a year in which artificial intelligence came to the, uh, the fore in the, in the public eye as well, uh, because it was the year in which the film uh, Forbidden pa Planet was uh, released, which featured uh, Robbie the Robot, uh, which, and I hold up Robbie as the, um, the gold standard for artificial intelligence, really, because this was a, uh, a thinking, communicating uh, machine that, uh, uh, that could uh, interact with, with humans uh, in, in an intelligent way. Moving forward to 2012, uh, some of you will have seen the, the video that I showed us as you were coming in of uh, the Asimo robot from Honda. There are other robots from other manufacturers. Um, and uh, it's an impressive piece of engineering, but uh, to my mind, it's, uh, it's not really uh, a patch on Robbie. It's still got a long way to go to really uh, achieve uh, anything like human mental faculties. But that's not really the point of my talk. My point of my talk is that whilst this is quite eye-catching, what's really impressive is that uh, artificial intelligence can, can deliver practical benefits. Now, in terms of the techniques behind uh, artificial intelligence, or AI, they can be broadly broken down into two types. Uh, Knowledge-based intelligence, which uses words to, uh, to represent explicit concepts. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about rule-based systems, but there are other uh, techniques as well. Um, and I'm, I think those are distinct from relational uh, intelligence, where there is no explicit w model expressed in words. It's uh, more of an implicit model um, in a numerical system. And I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about neural networks, genetic algorithms, uh, and fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic, you'll notice, I've put in both camps because it, it, it's, it uh, has features of both uh, using words but uh, also features of using uh, numerical computational intelligence. So to kick off as a, with an example of a, a rule-based system, a simple rule-based system, this is a, a sketch of a, an industrial uh, boiler, quite complex, works at high pressures, high temperatures, uh, and you could uh, envisage, uh, you could implement uh, a rule-based system to help either run that system automatically or to advise a human in how to uh, interact and operate that system. And I've put, proposed a simple rule at the top there that says if the pressure is above a certain value and the release valve is closed, then you can deduce that the release valve must be stuck because it should be open under those circumstances. And you can build up a set of such rules to represent concepts about the, how the boiler works and uh, diagnosing conditions associated with it. You can add an element of uh, sophistication by throwing in some uncertainty. So uh, if those conditions apply, then the release valve is probably stuck with a certain probability. And that sort of approach um, was very successful in the early days of artificial intelligence. So some of the... Um, the classic examples of artificial intelligence that emerged uh, during, the, uh, the, during the 1970s uh, were based on that kind of approach, using rules in particular and other knowledge-based approaches to represent these, uh, these concepts. So Dendral was for uh, a system for interpreting mass spectrograms. 
you've got mycin for uh, diagnosing infectious blood disorders. Um, and then a series of systems known as Xcon and Xcel uh, through the 1980s were held up as a huge commercial success for Digital Equipment Corporation who used this uh, expert system, this knowledge-based system, to, um, to configure its range of microcomputers. Uh, and it's claimed that they were saving uh, $25 million per annum uh, throughout the 80s using this system to advise on that uh, configuration of their computers. And this sort of approach is still valid, it's still being used and still being developed today. Uh, and I've thrown in a couple of more up-to-date examples. Uh, the SmartGov for uh, helping local authorities to develop public-facing websites. Uh, size Expert, uh, a system for interpreting seismic data for the purposes of, uh, of oil exploration. Uh, but those are no longer famous, as it were. The, uh, the early ones are quite famous because they were, they were uh, breaking the mold, setting a new trend. So now we're at the stage where such systems are still being implemented, but they're not newsworthy anymore. They're still useful. And I think what's interesting to reflect on is that these early examples um, were very good at specialist areas of expertise. And you can draw up a spectrum of intelligent behavior from uh, low-level reaction coordination through, as it, levels of understanding increase, through... Uh, human behaviours involving language, perception, common sense, interaction, through to specialist areas of expertise. And as I say, it's these specialist areas that were uh, first tackled with uh, artificial intelligence techniques. And if you go to the lower end of the spectrum, the sort of more uh, regulation, reaction, control, that's also been tackled quite successfully from, uh, uh, you know, for several decades. If you look at, for instance, here, the uh, uh, robots on a car assembly line. Um, they're very good at what they do, but there's very low level of intelligence or understanding in there. What they're doing is uh, but highly impressive uh, automation. So turning again to my spectrum of intelligent behaviour, it's as though from the early days we've been quite successful in what those uh, robotic arms in the car assembly plant were doing, and we've been quite successful in what specialist experts, whether they be medics, engineers, lawyers, uh, can do. But what's been more challenging has been this area in the middle of the spectrum where we're trying to uh, mimic what humans do on a daily basis with barely a conscious thought, without actually um, thinking that they're doing anything particularly intelligent. And to, uh, to illustrate that point, I'm going to show a photograph which uh, some of you have seen before, a uh, picture taken from my back garden, um, which shows the day when a, a, a wild rabbit visited the garden to visit the, uh, the pet rabbit. Um, so glancing at that picture, um, you know, assuming that you've uh, got the benefit of full sight, uh, you can uh, rapidly see that there are three rabbits in that picture. Uh, uh, two live ones and a stone rabbit in the, in the background. Um, and you can make that deduction despite the fact they're, they're different shapes and sizes and indeed the pet rabbit is uh, partially as obscured as well. Uh, you can also rapidly uh, recognize the, uh, the flowers in the, in the garden. All that's done almost instantaneously and yet very difficult for a, a machine to display that level of intelligent behavior. Um, but progress is being made and the sort of techniques that are being used for that type of problem uh, are in the computational intelligence camp that I've uh, referred to earlier. So I'm going to briefly describe three types of uh, <coughs> computational intelligence. Neural networks, uh, and I'm going to focus on their use for classifying. Genetic algorithms for optimizing, and I'll say a little bit about fuzzy logic as well. So starting with neural networks, this is a, an image of a, a biological neural network, the sort of neural network that's in, uh, uh, in humans and, and, and other living animals. This is a, a, an artificial neural network, which is... Um, a, a computer implementation of something that has some similarity to a, a biological neural network. Personally, I'm almost embarrassed to call this sort of thing a neural network because it's such a pale imitation of a, a biological neural network. Uh, but nonetheless, that's the, um, that's the label that attaches. Uh, and what we're looking at here is a simple type of neural network called a multi-layered perceptron or a backpropagation network. These have been around since uh, the mid-80s uh, when this 
technique was developed. Um, and nowadays things have advanced and uh, there is actually more of a thrust towards uh, artificial neural networks which are more biologically plausible, which are a closer representation. Um, these are not, in my view, biologically plausible, but they are useful, which again comes back to the theme of the, the talk. Uh, and I'm going to illustrate that with an example, a practical example, uh, and that is reading um, handwritten characters. What you see on the screen here are a set of 100 handwritten characters um, taken from uh, postcodes written on real envelopes by, uh, you know, by, by real users of the postal service. And what I'm going to do with a neural network uh, is see if we can train a network to learn from, uh, from some examples to, uh, to interpret some uh, handwritten characters it's not previously seen. So what I've done is I've put a box around one example of each character. I'm going to train a neural network on the other examples, the other nine of each character, and then see if it can recognize the unseen one in the box. Excuse me while I get my glasses on. So, here's a neural network I made earlier. Um, <laughs> and what I'm going to do, is, this is very much like the, uh, the image you, you saw earlier. It's a, a neural network made of internet, simple interconnecting processing units, which are these little blobs here. They're interconnected in the way shown in that earlier diagram. And what I'm going to demonstrate is that this network can learn from the examples. And the way it learns is by adjusting the weights, the numerical weights, on the links between those nodes. So I'm going to set it running by learning from those nine examples of each uh, digit. And you'll see that the error, there'll be an error graph appear, which will, then, which will rapidly decline as it becomes more and more expert at recognizing those, uh, those examples. So there you go, that's trained it. You see the error fell as it was started to get better and better at learning about those, uh, those examples. And as I say, when I say learning, all it's really doing is adjusting weights, numerical weights, on the interconnections between those nodes so that it becomes better and better at associating particular inputs with particular outputs. The inputs are going to be the handwritten characters. The output is going to be its classification of what that character is. Maybe that will become clearer when I test it. Let's test it with, uh, uh, with the first example, which is a zero. Uh, and if it thinks it's a zero, we should see uh, some activity at this first node, and the others should show a lack of activity. So, success. <coughs> Hasn't seen this example of a number zero before, but I present it, I've presented the handwritten character at this input layer, and it's recognized it at the output layer. So I'll just run through the remaining digits and see if it gets uh, the other ones right. Next up, the digit uh, one, uh, which it's also got right. You get the idea? So let's see how it gets on with the, the number two. It's got that right. Number three, it's got that right. It's looking pretty good so far. Number four, oops got that one wrong. So I was expecting this uh, node to light up, or is it actually that one? So it thinks it's a nine. See what it makes of number five. It's got the number five wrong as well. Number six. Number six it's got right. Number seven it's got right. Number eight it's got right. And number nine it's got right. So, oops, wrong way. So, what we've shown is that a neural network from this set of examples got eight out of ten right. Um, and I've deliberately pr presented something that's imperfect to illustrate. On the one hand, that's pretty good that it's managed to learn so rapidly from such a limited set of samples. On the other hand. I also wanted to illustrate that a problem like this is not straightforward, and to really tackle this in real life, you'd need a much bigger set of examples than just the nine of each character, and you'd probably need a more sophisticated neural network and a more sophisticated way of uh, putting the, uh, uh, the handwritten characters into the network. 
but it gives you the principle. It shows that actually, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a very effective technique. Let me move on to genetic algorithms, and we'll sort of bring this together uh, in later. Uh, genetic algorithms are used for optimization. That is to say, um, looking for the best uh, combination of values for a particular problem. So, uh, in a sort of abstract sense, if you're looking for, um, you could, s in this graph, we're looking for the best combination of x and y, which gives us the, the best uh, optimum so called fitness, the thing that we're trying to maximize. Um, and as this graph shows, this is the global optimum, this is the best combination of x and y, but it's easy to fall into the trap of finding these instead, these local optima. Um, pretty clear in that example, um, but other challenges in optimization are, are less straightforward. Here's another similar kind of surface uh, where the optimum is, uh, is not so straightforward. And perhaps more, more commonly, you're not just dealing with two variables, you're actually dealing with very many variables and you're trying to find the best combination of them. It's just that's a bit more difficult to, to plot on a graph. But what a neural network does, pardon me, not a neural network, what a <coughs> genetic algorithm does is try to tackle that through, uh, through Darwinian principles. And it's, uh, the idea is it's a population-based optimization where you have a population of candidate solutions to a problem like that. Um, and uh, it's based on survival of the fittest. You have, let's say, I'm going to show you an example in the moment, actually, where we have a population of 40 candidate solutions. Um, each of those solutions is a point in that search space, in that landscape. Uh, each has a chance of reproducing. Uh, and its chance of reproducing is greater the fitter that solution is, the better that solution is. And the offspring, as with, uh, as with biological systems, are not exact re replicas of the, the parents. And the population, therefore, evolves, and it evolves towards the fittest solution, the best solution. I'll show you that in operation, and then I'll show you a practical example, which hopefully will sort of uh, bring it more down to earth, as it were. Um, so here, I'm going to start with a demonstration, and we're going to show you uh, that simple example I showed at the top, where you had two variables in a landscape where there, was, there were three peaks, and you were trying to find the tallest peak. Um, the representation is slightly different, but this is the same idea in this kind of um, contour map. Um, so three peaks. I've made it slightly more challenging, though, because this is the tallest one, but it's also quite narrow, so quite hard to find. I'm going to set a genetic algorithm going to see if it can find it. Set it going slowly. And what you might be able to see, it might be hard to see, I don't know, but there's little dots on this map here. And they are the uh, candidate solutions. They're my population of candidate answers. And, at the out and every time they move, that's a new generation. The best ones have been selected, they've been bred, they've produced offspring. And at the start, they're all gathered around this local optimum. They found an optimum, but it's not the global optimum. Uh, but you'll also see red dots appearing elsewhere in the map, in the graph, as, as offspring are appearing elsewhere, because they're not exact replicas of their parents. And after a while, and you start to see it happen now, the, uh, the population has evolved and has now evolved so that it's uh, onto this more global optimum solution. So through Darwinian principles, uh, we found a, uh, an optimum solution to uh, to this rather abstract problem. Uh, but it's a very practical approach. And let me show you an example now that... Um, um, that comes from uh, a PhD student project, um, which was to do with uh, building not just autonomous robots that move around the floor, but autonomous robots that can move in three dimensions. In other words, uh, an autonomous helicopter. Um, and, a, and a starting condition for such a, a system, um, I'll skip that bit, is that it has to be stable in flight. And uh, I'm going to show you a video in a moment to show that um, to make it s stable and able to point forwards, just simply to make it point forward, because these things are very unstable, and what we've done is tethered the, uh, the helicopter, just to label it to move left and right, and it's controlled using a very con conventional controller uh, known as a PID controller, Proportional Integral and Derivative 
controller. But that approach requires parameters to be tuned. For, for such a, this simple engineering approach requires tuning of the parameters. Uh, and with what we've demonstrated was that a genetic algorithm could do just that. So here's our, our tethered helicopter. And to start off with, it's meant to be pointing forwards. To start off with, as soon as we set it going, it swings around, mainly, points, mainly, mainly geared towards the, uh, the right-hand side. After a little, little bit, once it's settled down, now it's settled down, it's pointing, it's not quite pointing at 90 degrees, but it's a bit closer. Now, a bit, little bit later, which has come on now, and now it's settled down, pointing forwards, much more steady, pointing forwards. Again, now it's much more evolved. As soon as you switch it on, quickly <coughs> settles on a forward point position. So what it's done is tuned these, uh, these engineering parameters for the, uh, the PID controller so that it's, so it's optimised. Um, and not only is it optimised, but it's optimised better than a human uh, expert was able to do, as this graph shows. We started with the helicopter veering wildly off 90 degrees from the direction it needed to be, uh, and that rapidly improved. But if you look at the, uh, the end point, the, uh, the genetic algorithm has a lower error than the hand-tuned uh, version of those parameters. And what's happening here is we're just starting again with it pointing, in, starting off in the other direction, pointing in the other direction. So now you know about uh, rule-based systems, you know about uh, neural networks, you know about genetic algorithms. The last of the sort of suite of techniques I want to talk about uh, is fuzzy logic. Um, and the point about fuzzy logic is that it's to do with using vague language, um, but there's an underlying precision. So there, there's this notion of computing with words. So you can say what you mean uh, and it will and, and get the answer you're looking for. And the key thing about fuzzy logic is that other, unlike rules, which we saw an example earlier, of the boiler where it said if the pressure was at a certain value, then this is your conclusion. It's a bit more subtle. What we're saying is, uh, according to the degree of satisfaction of the condition, then the conclusion scales accordingly. And here's a very practical example which shows that fuzzy logic is actually out there in everyday appliances from, a, from your digital camera. Um, digital cameras automatically adjust for the ambient light levels. Um, Many of them use fuzzy logic. And here's a couple of fuzzy rules which would do the job. If the light level's high, then the iris should be small. If the light level's low, then the iris should be large. Uh, and what fuzzy logic will, how fuzzy logic will interpret that is that essentially the, uh, the higher the light level, the, um, the smaller the iris. Uh, so it scales accordingly. Um, so a very powerful technique. And I'm going to show you uh, another example uh, to how this sort of technique can actually uh, benefit society. I'm going to show you a video clip in a moment, which was work that I've not personally been involved in, but some of my former colleagues were at, uh, at De Montfort University. And this was to do with um, monitoring elderly people in their own home to check that they're OK and they haven't suffered a fall. Um, and what, what these fuzzy rules do is monitor a so-called voxel, which is a kind of um, a pixelated silhouette of the person. Uh, so it's less intrusive than, uh, than looking at a real video of the person themselves. It's been sort of depersonalized before being fed through to the uh, computer system. But what it's saying is we'll monitor this uh, silhouette of the person and apply some fuzzy logic principles. If the, uh, the centroid of that uh, image is, is high, and its horizontal alignment is, is low, and its maximum height is high, uh, then we'll say that that's got a high level of uprightness. Or in other words, we don't think that person has suffered a fall. And conversely, with different conditions, we think they may have suffered a fall. And let's look at that in action. I'll set this running, and then I'll explain what's going on. Um, what we've got on the uh, right-hand side uh, is an image of somebody, ostensibly an elderly person, actually it's not a very elderly person, but a person uh, in their home being monitored by two cameras. And down here is the uh, voxel version, a sort of a, a pixelated, depersonalized version of that person. And what we're monitoring in the graph 
is their degree of uprightness, if you like, our confidence that they're okay, that they haven't suffered a fall. And here's the timeline. So as this person bobs down, we think, we think their uprightness is low. There's a little bob here as they... As they and then... Uh, and now we're confident that they're, they're upright, they're okay. So that's an, a, a, an example of uh, you know, potential practical benefits of a, of a fuzzy logic approach. Now I said at the start that um, my um, pet area is, uh, is hybrids and that's what I want to come on to now. Um, and, although, and I have said at the outset that I want to talk about practical examples, but what I'm not going to do is, uh, if you give, is give you a, a representative survey of practical examples. I'm actually going to show you some practical examples that I've personally been, been involved in. Um, and for a long time I've been involved with developing a so-called blackboard model. And um, first, first of all, I must say that this has nothing to do with blackboard, the, uh, the virtual learning environment that many colleagues will be familiar with. Um, uh, nothing to do with that, but it is a, it's a technique that, um, as, as it says here, brings together, in my view, the best of all worlds. It's a way of use, bringing together multiple techniques to tackle complex problems. Um, essentially, use the, the appropriate technique for each subtask, and essentially, it's about modelling a team rather than an individual. Uh, so, who remembers the numbskulls? A, f a few. Um, this is a cartoon. Uh, character whose, um, whose brain had these kind of specialist compartments, each with uh, little, little characters uh, dealing with specialist tasks within the brain. And that's very much the approach that the, uh, the Blackboard system, the hybrid approach, uh, uses. Um, it's actually called a Blackboard model because it's meant to emulate uh, a team of experts gathered around a Blackboard, or you might say a whiteboard these days, uh, and they communicate their ideas by writing them on the Blackboard. In a software system, you have these modules or agents, these software self-contained agents, or as I say, software modules, which can work together on a problem, and they communicate by writing to an area of shared memory in the computer, which is called the blackboard. So uh, I've um, been uh, fortunate to lead a, uh, a whole series of research projects over many years uh, that started with a system which we called ARBS for Algorithmic and Rule-Based Blackboard System. It subsequently became DARBS when it became distributed ARBS. Um, and it was distributed in the sense that these agents, these software modules, can now be anywhere on the internet uh, communicating together and working collaboratively. And I want to run through some of the applications of, uh, of ARBS and DARBS to give you that uh, context. Um, uh, but as I say, very much my, my personal engagement with some practical applications. Starting with ultrasonic imaging, this was the uh, application that really triggered the development of uh, ARBS as it was at the time. It, it, the development of this software was essentially a requirement for the approach we were taking. Um, and this is industrial ultrasonic imaging that we were looking at, um, how, interpreting images from components like this steel slab here that's got a weld in the middle of it, down the middle of it, and trying to um, check the images to see if there's any defects within. The images are formed using a set of different uh, ultrasonic probes mounted together and scanned backwards and forwards in a raster across the surface. So each pass across the surface of the component um, generates a cross-section image that looks like this. So unlike medical ultrasonic images, which are a, a direct visual representation, these uh, engineering images are not like that. Uh, essentially, they're just a set of clues as to what's uh, in, the, uh, in the component. It's a different form of um, contrast that's used. Effectively, each dot represents uh, a, a pulse that's, uh, that's, that's been echoed and received back. Uh, and its position is, uh, in, the, in the image is based on a, an assumption of its time of flight and, its, and, and the assumption it's had a simple out, <coughs> reflect, back path. So, we set to using a, 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 an artificial intelligence approach to interpreting uh, images like this, but I think typically of the many real-world tasks, 
it is, it is very complex and multi-layered and actually needs a, uh, an armory of different approaches. So the first uh, agent, as it were, that's, that's required here uh, is to fit some lines to the, uh, these dots uh, to pick out the key features. And uh, this agent has used the so-called Huff transform to pick out the lines. Other agents, which are rule-based, have applied heuristic knowledge to recognize, oops, pardon me, to uh, recognize that this, for instance, is the back wall of the component. So what we're looking at is top of the component, back of the component. This is a cross-section through it. So a rule has picked that out. Although it's not actually labeled, another rule has picked out that, uh, that this uh, is an artifact, this line here, an artifact caused by some reverberation in the kit itself. Then another intelligent agent has carried out some filtering to pick out which are the important lines of, uh, of features in this image. And then my final image is where lots of, lots of things are actually going on, is that uh, uh, an agent has detected that these are the two really interesting areas, it's drawn a box around them, and it's tried to classify those. And who remembers how you classify? Neural, neural network, yeah, well done. So uh, <laughs> a neural network is used to uh, classify each of these areas in this example. And in this particular case, the neural network has found that, um, that in each case, that it's associated with a smooth crack. Uh, in other words, that it's a cracked tip. So another agent has then hypothesized that actually what we've got here is a crack running between these two features. And it looks for supporting evidence elsewhere in the image, which it actually found. It went back to the back wall echo, remember that bit along here, and found there was a shadow underneath <coughs> the crack. It also revisited these things, which are artifacts, but they're artifacts produced by the crack. Uh, they're caused by ultrasound echoing between the crack tips and creating the impression of a longer time of flight. So there was supporting evidence. So that's why we've ended up with uh, a planar defect, that's a crack to you and I, uh, being confirmed joining those two points. So that was the application that really kicked off ARBs and, and led to various other apl subsequent applications. The next one was a project with uh, British Telecom uh, to control and manage their uh, trunk telecommunications network. Um, this is quite a while ago now, so this is what the uh, trunk telecommunications network of BT looked like uh, some 20 years ago. Um, and it required manual, and probably still does actually, required manual intervention to monitor the, uh, the network through a, a control centre at Oswestry near the uh, Welsh borders, where they would uh, monitor traffic on the network, look for points of congestion, and actively intervene to uh, reroute traffic and to restrict traffic on overloaded uh, links on the network. Um, and this, is their, this, is, this screen dump that you see here is uh, British Telecom's um, simulation of the network and what's going on in the background behind it is uh, ARBS, a, a multi-agent approach, is, uh, is controlling this and managing this uh, simulated network. Uh, so there's various things going on here but they're all as a result of decisions made by the intelligent system. So, uh, so up here we've got um, so-called call gapping applied to one particular route, that's a way of limiting the traffic on a particular route. Uh, we've got a so-called trunk reservation factor on these particular routes. Again, that's another way of controlling traffic. Uh, and probably the most complex intervention is illustrated in this window here, where the intelligence controller is rerouting traffic around congested nodes. So it's active intervention by the intelligence system to, uh, to optimize and improve the performance of the network. And then the next application of uh, ARBs that I wish, or uh, which became DARBs that I want, wish to highlight, is uh, an application to do with uh, plasma deposition. Uh, I was fortunate in getting uh, two consecutive quite uh, large research council grants to lead a project in this area, where uh, plasma in this context is uh, low pressure ionized gas. Um, so in this low pressure vessel here, put a specimen here, and depending on the conditions, ye, the ions from the plasma, they will, uh, they will bombard the specimen. As, and depending on the conditions, they'll either knock atoms off the surface, which gives you plasma etching, or they'll deposit, they'll stick on the surface, which gives you plasma deposition. We were dealing with plasma deposition, so that's laying down thin films. We were laying down thin films of artificial diamond. 
It's an important process in the semiconductor industry. It's also used for high-value mechanical components. Um, I'm not going to describe in any detail how it works, but I have picked out various things in blue and in red. And things in blue are some of the things you can measure, and the things in red are some of the things you can control. Unfortunately, the things you can control are not the same as the things you can measure, uh, so this is a notoriously difficult process to, uh, to manage and control. And um, sort of analytical models to, uh, to, to this approach have been unsuccessful. It's just been too complex to sort of build up the model for using sort of principles of physics. Uh, so we took a different approach, which was rather than model the process, we'll model the, the person, the human operator, and actually capture their approach to controlling uh, this plasma deposition. And that turned out to be uh, highly successful. So this is the kit we were using. This is looking through the window um, when the plasma is on. I'm just going to show you a, a video clip now showing a plasma, a plasma deposition process under control of the uh, multi-agent system. Here's some noise in the background, which is the pumping system. And uh, you'll also hear a different pump click in as the pump control system, the specific agent for that task, is doing its task. So you hear the click as the different pump comes in. And what we're seeing on the screen at the moment is the specialist agent whose task is to manage the pumps. We'll then see a different agent will be, look, will be running in parallel, and a different agent will, also, will now be looking at the electrical conditions, fire up the plasma, and that uses fuzzy logic to maintain those uh, electrical conditions within the uh, required range. And the final thing there that I'm going to show you is, we see it in this uh, screen dump of that very final image, is another specialist agent I'm not going to describe the technicalities, but it's another example of a very specialist agent doing a specialist job within this broad uh, task. And this is tuning a so-called Langmuir probe, which is a device that measures the electron energy. But what's, what I want to draw to your attention is the set of 14 different sliders here. There are 14 parameters that need to be adjusted to tune this device. Similar in a way to that helicopter, where there are parameters that need to be tuning, tuned but more complex, there are actually 14 here. Very difficult for a human operator to do. Piece of cake for a genetic algorithm. And indeed, this particular application, just this narrow subset, uh, won the uh, machine intelligence competition run by the British Computer Society back in 2002. Um, and, but you know, what, uh, what the uh, multi-agent system was able to do was to control the whole process from pumping down, running the system, gracefully turning it off at the end. Um, using a multi-agent approach. And the final application of ARBs and DARBs that I want to highlight is to do with um, print defect detection. Um, I was approached by a small company that manufactures uh, screen printed uh, bottles, packaging. Uh, this, is particularly, this is from a shampoo bottle. Um, and they were trying to uh, detect defects in the screen printing. And what surprised me, actually, was that how fussy uh, their customers are. The, the screen printing really needs to be perfect, otherwise the products are, are rejected. Um, and they were looking for some advice about how, uh, how that process could be uh, automated. Uh, and they had tried what you might think was the common sense approach, which was to compare an image of the, uh, of the sample with a so-called perfect image, as it were, subtract the two, and that should reveal the defect. Uh, but what they found, as anybody working in this field would have found, is that um, the images never quite register. You can't quite get them to align. Because um, they're, never, they're never perfectly aligned. Um, if you get it right in one corner, it will be wrong in another corner. What you really need to do to get images to align is to distort one so it fits across the... Uh, across the surface of the, uh, the reference image. A complex task, but we tackled it using a multi-agent system where each agent took a different part of the image and registered each part of the image separately and then brought the whole thing together as a whole. And um, so what we were able to do using that approach was to identify defects like this, carry out the registration, uh, and isolate defects such as that. So another practical uh, approach to, uh, to, the, to the use of this hybrid system. Um, 
one interesting sort of sideline that occurred um, through work of a PhD student was uh, looking at, trying to look, sort of look f into the future where, um, and imagine whether, test the feasibility of uh, a multi-agent sophisticated system like this not being on special hardware but actually being on very cheap hardware that might be embedded in everyday appliances. Uh, and what this s photograph shows is we, that we ran a multi-agent system doing the, just the sort of tasks that you've just seen, but on very low cost kit, where each of these circuit boards has a processor on it of the type that's used in a mobile phone and costs less than 50 pence each. Uh, and using that approach, there's four agents, four parallel agents running on this system. We were able to carry out these, the kind of intelligent system uh, processes that you've just seen, uh, but on on very low cost kit. So sort of, as I say, th this, this particular uh, setup is obviously not very practical, but to demonstrate the, the principle of, uh, of a future in which uh, systems like this might be uh, embedded in everyday appliances. So I want to finish off with a few other projects um, which don't use my uh, multi-agent Blackboard system, but nonetheless show some, some of the practical benefits. And these have all come from PhD projects. Uh, this first one, what you see there is a geological map. Uh, this is done by a, a student who works for the uh, Italian Geological Society. Um, geological maps, uh, maps that uh, represent not the surface of the earth, but uh, the layers beneath. Um, that's a conventional hand-drawn map, a rather outmoded approach now, as uh, the approach towards generating maps like this is, uh, is so-called maps on demand, where the, uh, the data are gathered in the field and then the map is generated automatically uh, to whatever scale you wish. But what that threw up is the fact that uh, cartographers actually apply a certain amount of judgment uh, in drawing maps, uh, and that judgment needed to be emulated if we were to draw maps automatically on demand. And the sort of judgment I'm talking about is the level of detail that's appropriate for whatever scale you're drawing the map. And maybe more subtly, uh, cartographers take a certain amount of artistic license in terms of moving the labels on the map in order to make them uh, legible so that they don't obscure each other. And making that sort of judgment, again, required a, 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 an intelligent approach actually based on your rules. Another one which I really ought to highlight because it was in the publicity information um, was to do with uh, a pre-screening of um, oral cancer. This was a project by a retired dentist um, who had a particular interest and concern about uh, uh, oral cancers. And the, the concept was if the dentist could routinely photograph mouth ulcers and, take it and do a sort of pre-screen just to isolate any cases which might warrant first further investigation in case they were actually cancerous ulcers. Very few are, but those that are, are dangerous. Uh, so what you see in the top two fi pictures are uh, so-called recurrent aphthous stomatitis, which is uh, basically an in innocuous uh, ulcer that everybody gets from time to time. Um, down here, we've got a, a different type of ulcer called uh, rectilinear lichen planus, which is not in itself dangerous, but does need to be monitored. Uh, and then finally, we've got the, uh, the cancerous ulcers, which do need to be uh, uh, detected. And uh, he applied a, a neural network classification approach it was actually a hierarchical neural network, so uh, the outputs from the neural networks cascaded to each other and had produced some promising results. Uh, as a, uh, probably about as far much as I can say to take this further, we really, really do need access to a, a good uh, large database of examples. Uh, another student working in the nuclear industry, um, where in the nu nuclear power plants, m a whole stack of different variables are monitored. This is one that sort of relates to reactant coolant pressure. Uh, but variables like this are monitored, and there are these action limits, uh, a sort of tolerance, if you like. And if, if the variable, whatever it is, goes beyond those tolerance limits, some action is required, uh, which can often be quite expensive in, if it requires taking the machine out of action. Uh, so what he was looking at was using neural networks to, uh, to see if he could spot trends in advance of uh, these action limits being, being reached. So we could actually predict, anticipate uh, uh, something going out of tolerance. Which brings me towards the end. What I've had is done there is a gallop through a range of different practical applications that I've personally enjoyed being involved 
with. Um, in terms of where this takes us for the future, um, I think we are seeing that in intelligence spectrum being bridged now through, the, through these techniques uh, so that the whole range of human intelligent behaviours is gradually uh, being achieved. I've talked a little about, about embedded artificial <coughs> intelligence, a future where these um, techniques are not just on specialist kit but are in everyday uh, devices. Um, I think we can see, um, we already are seeing uh, the use of distributed knowledge. That is to say, the expertise, the knowledge doesn't have to all be in the intelligent computer system per se. Knowledge can be drawn from other sources using the internet. And finally, um, the, the Blackboard system, DARBS, um, perhaps see that, the further developments of the embedded version of that on parallel hardware. Very keen to see new applications, if anybody can see an application. Um, and one of the things I've been really excited about over the last 12 months is that uh, DARBS is now available as an open source software. It is out there. Anybody can download it uh, and uh, implement it and work on it. What I really like to see is a, a community of users both developing it and, uh, and using it. So in conclusion, um, there has been some progress uh, towards human mimicry uh, with machines like the Asimo uh, robot, but we're a long, long way short of achieving real, true human intelligent behaviour. But that wasn't really the point of the lecture. The point of the lecture was to demonstrate that this work has, um, has created many practical, usable systems. And what I, to finally finish up, I want to show you that I do practice what I preach. This is a video I took in my flat, just across the way. Um, this is my robot vacuum cleaner, I'm very proud of. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a spotless flat. And as you see, this uses some basic artificial intelligence, very basic artificial intelligence, to navigate its way around the flat uh, and to make sure that my flat is uh, nice and clean and tidy. So you um, You see it down there. It's got some, uh, some de detection features, so it's very good at slowing down and stopping before it hits a wall. It's, you may notice it's not very good at avoiding the chair legs. It crashes into those, so he finds those a bit harder to see. But unlike a conventional vacuum cleaner, it's very good at going underneath the, uh, the furniture too. There you go, going underneath the sofa. And when it's finished, it, uh, it goes back and docks itself on its charging station. Uh, shall I run it for just a few more seconds to show that? There you go. So when it's finished, it just goes back and uh, docks itself on the uh, charging station so it's ready for its next, uh, next use. Um, and finally, just to note that all the work that I've shown this evening has really been on the back of uh, other people's efforts and uh, they're listed there. Thank you very much. The Labour Greens kindly agreed to uh, take any questions or comments or observations on that, so please do fire away. Yeah, we have it over here. In your first uh, neural network architecture, you had two biases introduced to your layers. Just want to know what's the purpose of that? Is it for training? Um, yeah, the bias. Um, Sorry, first of all, did people hear that? Yeah. No, you might um, be worth just sort of uh, summarising the question. Yeah, the, um, the questioner noticed that um, in the neural network there were so-called bias, uh, biases, which is um, it's really just um, an extra node to... Um, which is a, a useful way of uh, shifting the output to make sure that it's not just... If, you th if, if those of you are familiar with uh, drawing a sort of straight line graph, it means that you're not just, uh, you're not just getting the gradient right, but you, you can shift it up and down uh, on the axis. That's the equivalent of what a bias is doing. It's really just a, a numerical adjustment to the behavior of the, to the outputs of, the, uh, of each node. Because essentially this is a numerical system, that's the point I really need to emphasize. Uh, each of those nodes in the neural network <coughs> is doing a very simple processing task it didn't actually say what it does, but what it does is it sums its uh, 
its, um, its weighted inputs and sends those to its outputs. So one of those weighted inputs is this so-called bias, uh, which is just a, an input which is of, of one, which is then weighted accordingly. So all it's doing, all the neural network do, is doing, is adjusting these, uh, these numerical weights. Very simple process, and the, the, the bias is just there as a, as a necessary uh, adjustment, as one of the adjustments. Yeah, we have a question there. Yeah, and how this work might apply to our work as a business school, and how you might take us along with it. Yeah. Um, that was the question about apply, how this work can apply to the business school. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it is very applicable to the, uh, the business school. In fact, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to see that uh, Elena is here this evening, who's uh, just about to embark upon a, a PhD project uh, in the business school, um, looking at some of the practical business benefits of these kind of approaches. Um, what we'll be doing in the first weeks of Elena's project is, uh, is, is refining uh, the, the nature of the business application, but um, the one that we certainly discussed in the initial stages uh, was uh, optimizing uh, logistics, where I've been in discussion with some uh, colleagues in the, uh, the rail freight industry who have some genuine uh, optimization challenges in the, uh, in the logistics of rail freight, making sure they get the uh, um, the, uh, the goods to the destination in the optimum fashion, but also uh, optimum fashion in terms of being most economic. But they've also got to be mindful of regulations about the drivers, uh, their terms and conditions. They've also got to be mindful about the, uh, um, getting the drivers home again. So there's a, you know, it's, it's a complex logistic task. That's one area. But there are other application areas too. I'm very interested in possibly using uh, uh, neural network type approaches for working with uh, uh, colleagues in the uh, in the finance and economics area as a uh, uh, forecasting tool. Um, and, and as another example, there may be possibilities of using the, the multi-agent approach for, um, for automated sort of uh, contractual negotiation. Really interesting area where you give uh, agents different uh, um, sort of uh, uh, almost personalities, certainly different strategies for, for negotiation and, uh, <coughs> and they can represent your organization in a, in a, in a uh, sort of automated fashion. Yes. Yeah. I guess you, you might follow up for the things that the credit card companies did with uh, credit card screening, uh, transaction screening. I think some of the early examples that you used that they also used rule-based systems and more advanced systems for screening transactions and credit cards and financial transactions. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Went wrong in 2007, but earlier than that, quite Yeah. Yes, the question relates to um, use of uh, artificial intelligence techniques and specifically rule-based approaches um, for, for scrutinizing credit card transactions and spotting fraudulent transactions. And that's, uh, that's actually part of a, a rich area of artificial intelligence research that's, that's very current, actually, to do with, uh, with so-called data mining. So you're really looking at vast quantities of data using techniques like these to try and, try and spot patterns. In the, in the specific case of credit card transactions, it might be spotting uh, patterns which are out of the ordinary and therefore might raise suspicion of fraudulent behavior. Uh, but there's other things too. I mean, uh, it's, it's well known that um, our supermarkets are interested in consumer behavior uh, to, uh, uh, to, to optimize their, their business positioning. Uh, and the sort of techniques that they're using are very much drawing upon these, uh, these artificial intelligence techniques for that purpose. Yes, back there. How do you see artificial intelligence coping with language, Adrian? Um, understanding, talking, speaking, um, nuances of meaning, different languages, colloquial language? Um, well, what you've really put your finger on is one of the ha hardest challenges. So, uh, so the, the whole area of language understanding does sit right in the middle of the uh, the intelligence spectrum that I that I that I drew, and as I say, we're this sort of there's convergence from both ends. So there's 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 progress there, um, and certainly you know the whole area of understanding natural language is what you, you described. It doesn't really matter whether it's uh, whether it's English or another language. Um, you know, understanding natural language is a uh, is is a challenge, but there's been uh, there has been huge progress uh, made, and 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 different. Uh, Different techniques used. I mean, part of the uh, one of the one of the things, one of the benefits that uh, people working in this field have do have going for them, 
is that um, there are lots of uh, additional clues in language. There's lots of redundancies, if you, if you like. There are, so, uh, so even if one bit of the interpretation is, 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 is incorrect, it can be compensated by filling in the gaps, as it were, um, using the, the clues from, from, from other words. Um, and there's been, you know, I, I was also uh, involved in one particular project which was looking at, uh, looking at grammar, actually, and how, how you can uh, learn the, uh, which are the um, appropriate orderings of words, how they, how, how they fit together. So it's not just a case of dissecting the language into its component parts and trying to recognize each of them. It's very much to do with taking a, uh, an intelligent approach to the whole uh, uttered sentence, as it were. Um, but it's a challenging pro problem and some way to go. It depends on why it's shown. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, in the example of the nuclear, you gave us with the upper and lower action limits, why don't you just use a Schuhart control chart, um, <coughs> which, which would give you decision rules about trends, um, rather than take it further than that? Well, I suppose the, the point here is, um, um, is, is, is we're trying to uh, uh, anticipate things before they happen. And the point is, it, we wouldn't just be monitoring one of those. Uh, we'd be monitoring a whole stack of them together. So although I only showed one I perhaps rather oversimplified it by just showing one variable and saying that we'd be trying to predict um, when that might go out of, uh, out of its bounds. What we'd actually be monitoring is not just that variable, but its combination with all the other uh, variables. You might be ahead of me in, in whether other techniques uh, can, can do that, but certainly uh, uh, the neural network approach was able to, uh, to bring together um, many different variables uh, and uh, uh, and it's in, in a sense, it's another example of the data mining, if you like, looking for the, the patterns across many variables. Question here. Adrian, you, you showed the example of um, looking at whether elderly people had fallen over, which seems a very powerful. I mean, to what extent has that been applied? Because it, it seems to have a real, you know, given the population is aging, mm. et cetera, et cetera, it seems to have a real possibility. Yes, it, it, it does. Um, I suppose I. To be honest, I don't know the answer to that because, as I said, that of all the applications I showed, that was one that my colleagues had been involved with rather than me personally. So I'm not sure um, quite where they're at with that. But I know it's a it's a it's a major project which isn't just sort of terminated with that prototype. And indeed, I know that that was uh, that was actually an international collaboration with the uh, with the University of Missouri. So um, I'm, I'm sure it's being taken further, but I can't actually answer it, uh, the question as to what stage it's at at the moment. Um, no, no, I think it's a, a very pertinent question, and indeed, uh, I think I did spot in the audience some you know, a colleague, a former colleague, who's got some expertise in so-called uh, smart house and, and smart house and the smart office, where um, hi NASA, <laughs> um, uh, and you know that's very much to do with um, using a, a, a wealth of sensor data and making intelligent decisions and managing the uh, managing the building almost in almost in the sense of treating it as a, a sort of organic uh, being in terms of uh, you know, uh, optimizing and uh, and um, and being in tune with its with its with its rhythms. I think there was one final question here. So yeah. Just one more question, just because so many interesting things. But <coughs> In your last example, you used a neural network. You had combined two different kinds of neural network, coordinate network and perceptual. Was there any special reason for that? Um, yeah, well, I've um, obviously in the nature Given the nature of tonight's talk, I sort of rather glossed over the uh, the, the, the nature of neural networks. But um, you know, there are different. Uh, different types of neural network, and um, th they have different um, different capabilities. So the the, the multi-layered perceptron on the back propagation network is a, a classic classifying network. If you've got lots of um, uh, examples where you uh, where you can confirm um, you can f confirm the actual classification. So you've got examples where you know what the what the appropriate classification for those. Uh, those examples is, but there, and that's so-called supervised learning. 
you present it with an example, you see what output it produces and tell it whether it got it right or wrong and kind of reinforce its behavior to try and train it to get it right. Um, but there are other approaches like the Cajona network, which are so-called unsupervised networks, where what it's doing is, uh, is looking for patterns in the, uh, in the examples that you're presenting it. You're not telling it that there's a right answer, but uh, what, what the network is doing is clustering. It's looking for patterns which are similar uh, on some uh, on some measures, some metrics, um, and that's and the Cajona network was was found for some of that, uh, some aspects of that oral uh, uh, ulcer classification to be appropriate because it was particularly good at uh, recognizing similar characteristics of some of those images without us actually having to tell it the specific <coughs> classification. It was it was finding for itself, if you like, the uh, the closeness of some of the images. Adrian, thank you very much. I mean, I was very much looking forward to uh, tonight's lecture because this is a subject I knew very little to zero about. And uh, as a consequence, I've learned a massive amount and, uh, and also can really see the kind of potential applications for it. I'm uh, sort of taking you back to your original definition that uh, artificial intelligence mimics human, men human mental f uh, faculties in a machine. I kind of speculated that it would probably take a very simplistic uh, unsophisticated, unsophisticated machine to do the functions of a, of a university leadership team. Uh, and, uh, and maybe that's what you're working on next, actually. Uh, but anyway, uh, fascinating uh, lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Adrian. This has been uh, very much kicking off our, uh, our series this, this term. Hope you can attend uh, further lectures uh, throughout uh, the autumn. Uh, just look at our website, they'll be all publicised on that. But once again, can you please very much uh, thank Adrian. Thank you.